Martin's axiom gave me a reprieve from this self-promotion. Stop focusing on these little details, it told me. Focus instead on becoming better. Inspired, I turned my attention from my website to a habit that continues to this day. I track the hours spent each month dedicated to thinking hard about research problems. In the month in which I first wrote this chapter, for example, I dedicated 42 hours to these core tasks. This hour tracking strategy helped turn my attention back, above all else, to the quality of what I produce. At the same time, however, it also felt incremental, as if I hadn't yet grasped the full implications of Martin's radical idea. When I later launched my quest to uncover how people end up loving their work, it didn't take long for me to return to Martin's advice. Intuitively, I grasped that it played an important role in constructing a remarkable career. This is what led me to Jordan Tice. If I really wanted to understand this axiom, I figured, I needed to understand the people who live their lives by it. Listening to Tice talk about his routine, I was struck by his Martinesque focus on what he produces. As you'll recall, he's happy to spend hours every day, week after week, in a barely furnished monastic room, exhausting himself in pursuit of a new flat-picking technique, all because he thinks it will add something important to the tune he's writing. This dedication to output, I realized, also explains his painful modesty. To Jordan, arrogance doesn't make sense. Here's what I respect creating something meaningful and then presenting it to the world, he explained. Inspired by meeting Jordan, I got in touch with Mark Castevens to gain a cynical veteran's perspective on the performer's mindset. Mark is a studio musician from Nashville who has certainly earned his stripes. He's played on 99 number one hit singles on the Billboard charts. When I told Mark about Jordan, he agreed that an obsessive focus on the quality of what you produce is the rule in professional music. It trumps your appearance, your equipment, your personality, and your connections, he explained. Studio musicians have this adage, the tape doesn't lie. Immediately after the recording comes the playback, your ability has no hiding place. I like that phrase, the tape doesn't lie as it sums up nicely what motivates performers such as Jordan, Mark, and Steve Martin. If you're not focusing on becoming so good they can't ignore you, you're going to be left behind. This clarity was refreshing. To simplify things going forward, I'll call this output-centric approach to work the craftsman mindset. My goal in rule number two is to convince you of an idea that became clearer to me the more time I spent studying performers such as Tice. Irrespective of what type of work you do, the craftsman mindset is crucial for building a career you love. Before we get ahead of ourselves, however, I want to take a moment to contrast this mindset with the way most of us are used to thinking about our livelihood. After Kayville, a mutual friend set up a meeting between Alex and Michael Eisner, who, fresh from leaving Disney, was looking to create a television comedy as his first project as an independent producer. Alex got the meeting because he was a former staff writer for a network show, but it was his Curb Your Enthusiasm script that convinced Eisner to ask him to write a pilot for his new idea. Eisner liked the pilot draft, and Alex went on to help him co-create the show, Glenn Martin DDS, which aired for two seasons as a flagship program for Nickelodeon's Nick at Night block. It was as Glenn Martin was winding down that Alex sold his pilot to USA, and was staffed on one of their hit shows, Covert Affairs, the setting where I first introduced him to you. Alex's Capital To understand Alex Berger's various breaks, you need to understand the career capital that enabled them. For example, it was certainly a big deal for Michael Eisner to ask Alex to help him create a show, but think about what this break required. At the time, Alex had been a staff writer for a network show and had a quality comedy spec script, polished over many rounds of aggressive feedback in his portfolio. That's an important collection of capital. If you rewind the clock more and ask how Alex got a staff spot on Kayville, you once again discover a capital transaction. He had already written and aired an episode of another network drama, Commander-in-Chief. 
another important collection of capital. Rewind the clock further and ask how Alex, as a lowly script assistant, got a script aired on Commander-in-Chief, and you encounter the writing skill he had developed over the previous years spent obsessively honing his craft. A period where he was often working on three or four scripts at a time, always seeking feedback for how he could make them better. The Alex Berger who first arrived in L.A. fresh out of college did not have this writing skill capital. By the time he was working for Commander-in-Chief, however, he was ready for his first major transaction. In this telling, the story of Alex's fast rise is not one of passion triumphing over setbacks. It's much less dramatic. Alex, the former debate champion, coolly assessed what career capital was valuable in this market. He then set out with the intensity once reserved for debate prep to acquire this capital as fast as possible. What this story lacks in pizzazz, it makes up in repeatability. There's nothing mysterious about how Alex Berger broke into Hollywood. He simply understood the value and difficulty of becoming good. The most desirable job in Silicon Valley. Mike Jackson is a director at the Westley Group, a clean tech venture capital firm on Silicon Valley's famous Sand Hill Road. To say that Mike has a desirable job is an understatement. I have a friend who recently had dinner with the dean in charge of a top tier business school, he told me. And at this dinner, the dean said that everyone in their graduating class right now wants to be a clean tech VC. Mike has experienced this firsthand. He receives dozens of emails from business school students asking him about his path. He used to try to answer them, but now, due to time constraints, he mostly ignores them. Everyone wants my job, he explained. The fact that people covet his position isn't surprising. Clean energy is hot. It's a way to help the world, while at the same time, as Mike admitted, you make a lot of money. In his position, Mike has traveled the world, met senators, and spent time with the mayors of both Sacramento and Los Angeles. During one of our conversations, he mentioned that David Pluff, Barack Obama's campaign manager, had been hanging around the office. What interests me about Mike is that, like Alex Berger, he didn't arrive at his outstanding job by following a clear passion. Instead, he carefully and persistently gathered career capital, confident that valuable skills would translate into valuable opportunities. Unlike Alex, however, Mike started gathering capital before he knew what he wanted to do with it. In fact, he had never given a moment's thought to clean tech venture capital until a couple of weeks before his first interview. How Mike Jackson became a venture capitalist. Mike majored in biology and earth systems at Stanford. After earning his bachelor's degree, Mike elected to stay for a fifth year to earn a master's. The professor who supervised his master's was trying to decide whether or not to launch a major research project studying the natural gas sector in India. So he arranged Mike's thesis to act as an exploration of the project's viability. In the fall of 2005, after Mike finished his graduate degree, his supervisor decided he liked what he saw and launched the major research project. Not surprisingly, he asked Mike to help him lead it. At this point, Mike had just spent a year getting up to speed on its details. Mike, who is competitive by nature, tackled the project with intensity, driven by the belief that the better he did now, the better his options would be later. During this time, I traveled to India ten times and to China four or five times, in addition to quite a bit of travel in Europe, he recalls. I met with the heads of major utilities, and I learned how the global energy market really works. When the project concluded in the fall of 2007, Mike and his professor held a major international conference to release and discuss the results. Academics and government officials from around the world attended. With the project complete, Mike had to decide what to do next. Of the many valuable skills he picked up from the project, one in particular was a deep understanding of how the international carbon market works. As part of this expertise, he learned that the United States had an obscure exchange known as the Renewable Energy Credits Market. Almost no one understood these things. 
It was a really fractured market, with huge information asymmetry, he recalls. Being one of the few people who actually knew how this market worked, Mike decided to start a business. He called it Village Green. The idea was simple. You give money to Mike, he does complicated transactions that only he and a few other energy regulation wonks really understand. And then he offers you certification that you've purchased enough carbon offsets for your business to be deemed carbon neutral. Mike ran this business for two years along with a friend from Stanford and a rotating series of other partners. They were headquartered in a rental house not far from where he lived in San Francisco. The company never struggled to pay its expenses, but it also never became a thriving concern. So when the economy went sour in 2009, Mike and his partner decided to shutter it instead of hunkering down and trying to ride out the recession. We decided to get real jobs, is how Mike describes what happened next. Here's how the process unfolded. A stand-up comedian friend of Mike's had a girlfriend who was interviewing at a venture capital firm. She decided not to take the job, but recommended that they talk to Mike. She thought I would be a good fit for venture capital, given my experience with my company, he said. Mike knew that he was not a good match for this technology-focused fund. I have no idea how to find the next Facebook, he told me, but I could tell you if a solar energy firm was probably going to make money. He figured, however, that since he had never been through a real job interview before, the experience would provide good practice. The interview was pretty low-key because we both realized early on I wasn't going to get this job, but we hit it off on a personal level, he recalls. At some point in the discussion, the venture capitalist had an idea. You know, you would be a good match for this clean tech fund that's starting up, he said. Why don't I introduce you to my friend over there? In the summer of 2009, Mike started a trial period as an intern at the Wesley Group. In October, they gave him a full-time position as an analyst, and soon after, he was promoted to associate. Two years later, he became a director. When people ask me how I got my job, he now jokes, I tell them to make friends with a comedian. Three Disqualifiers for Applying the Craftsman Mindset Number 1. The job presents few opportunities to distinguish yourself by developing relevant skills that are rare and valuable. Number two, the job focuses on something you think is useless or perhaps even actively bad for the world. Number three, the job forces you to work with people you really dislike. A job with any combination of these disqualifying traits can thwart your attempts to build and invest career capital. If it satisfies the first trait, skill growth isn't possible. If it satisfies the second two traits, then even though you could build up reserves of career capital, you'll have a hard time sticking around long enough to accomplish this goal. John's job satisfied the first two traits, so he needed to leave. To give another example, as a computer scientist at MIT, which I was while writing this book, I got quite a few emails from Wall Street headhunters. They were hiring for jobs that provide plenty of room to develop skills, and they're not afraid to compensate you well for your time. There is a small handful of firms on Wall Street that pay better than everyone else, about three or four of them, said one headhunter who wrote me recently. This company is one of them. I was later told by friends that the starting salary for these firms was in the two to three hundred thousand dollar range. But to me, these firms satisfy the second condition previously mentioned. This realization allowed me to confidently delete these offers as they arrived. The big picture point worth noting here, however, is that these disqualifying traits still have nothing to do with whether a job is the right fit for some innate passion. They remain much more general. Working right, therefore, still trumps finding the right work. Now that I've made my pitch for the craftsman mindset and moderated it with the exceptions previously mentioned, it's time to see it in action. Chapter 6. The Career Capitalists In which I demonstrate the power of career capital in action with two profiles of people who leverage the craftsman mindset to construct careers they love. 
Two Career Capitalists Alex Berger is 31. He's a successful television writer and he loves his work. Mike Jackson is 29. He's a clean tech venture capitalist and he also loves his work. This chapter is dedicated to telling their stories as they both highlight the somewhat messy reality of using the craftsman mindset to generate fantastic livelihoods. Alex and Mike both focused on getting good, not finding their passion, and then used the career capital this generated to acquire the traits that made their careers compelling. The Closed-Off World of Television Cabillionaires Let's assume for the moment that you want to be hired as a television writer on a network series. Your first step is to get past someone like Jamie. Jamie, who is in his late twenties, was recently involved in the writer staffing process for a network show. He agreed to provide me a glimpse into his world so long as I kept him and his show anonymous. Here's what I learned. TV writing is not an easy gig to land. According to Jamie, the process unfolds as follows. First, the producers put out a call to talent agencies to send over sample scripts from their writers. For his particular show, Jamie received around a hundred packages, each containing a sample script, which Jamie read, reviewed, and graded. Only around the best twenty or so from this pile will be passed on to the producers for additional consideration. Keep in mind that the producers have already hired their favored veteran writers, so there are precious few spots left to be filled from this open call. To provide a sense of the competitiveness of this process, Jamie sent me a copy of his script evaluations. Out of the hundred or so writers who submitted scripts, all but fourteen sent a script that had already been produced and aired on television. Of the fourteen who had not yet broken into the industry, the highest score any received from Jamie was a 6.5 out of 10. Most of this group, however, fared much worse. It was flat, without any interesting storytelling, engaging act-outs, or smart dialogue, he wrote about one such script. Score, 4 out of 10. I only read about a quarter of this script, but it's clearly pretty subpar, he said about another. In other words, getting on the inside in the world of television writing is daunting. But at the same time, I can understand why so many thousands aspire to this goal. It's a fantastic job. For one thing, there's the money. As a new writer, your salary starts modest. The Writers Guild of America guarantees that you make at least $2,500 a week, which, given a standard 26-week season, is decent for a half a year of work. Depending on the success of the series, you'll then progress, after a year or two, to become a story editor, where, as a longtime TV writer explained in a Salon.com article on the topic, you're still making shit, though, as another writer admitted, shit at this point qualifies as over $10,000 an episode. Things start to get interesting when you make it to the next level, producer. Once there, you're in the money. Top writers can pull in seven-figure paychecks. In the Salon.com article referenced before, the term cabillionaire was used by multiple people to describe the salaries of producers on long-running shows. Of course, you can also make lots of money in other jobs. A fast riser at Goldman Sachs can hit the seven-figure mark, including bonuses, by his or her mid-thirties. And a partner at a prestigious law firm can get somewhere similar a few years later. But the difference between Wall Street and Hollywood in the style of work is staggering. Imagine no email, no late night contract negotiations, no need to master intricate bond markets or legal precedents. As a writer, your whole focus is on one thing, telling good stories. The work can be intense, as you're often under deadline to deliver the next script, but it only lasts half a year, and it's immensely creative, and you can wear shorts, and the catered food, as was emphasized to me several times, is fantastic. Writers are crazy about their food, one source explained. To recast the job in the terms I introduced in the last chapter, television writing is attractive because it has the three traits that make people love their work, impact, creativity, and control. 
The Passion Mindset People thrive by focusing on the question of who they really are and connecting that to work they truly love. Poe Bronson wrote this in a 2002 manifesto published in Fast Company. This should sound familiar as it's exactly the type of advice you would give if you subscribe to the passion hypothesis, which I debunked in rule number one. With this in mind, let's call the approach to work endorsed by Bronson the passion mindset. Whereas the craftsman mindset focuses on what you can offer the world, the passion mindset focuses instead on what the world can offer you. This mindset is how most people approach their working lives. There are two reasons why I dislike the passion mindset. That is, two reasons beyond the fact that, as I argued in rule number one, it's based on a false premise. First, when you focus only on what your work offers you, it makes you hyper-aware of what you don't like about it, leading to chronic unhappiness. This is especially true for entry-level positions, which, by definition, are not going to be filled with challenging projects and autonomy. These come later. When you enter the working world with the passion mindset, the annoying tasks you're assigned, or the frustrations of corporate bureaucracy, can become too much to handle. Second, and more serious, the deep questions driving the passion mindset, who am I and what do I truly love, are essentially impossible to confirm. Is this who I really am? And do I love this? Rarely reduced to clear yes or no responses. In other words, the passion mindset is almost guaranteed to keep you perpetually unhappy and confused, which probably explains why Bronson admits not long into his career seeker epic, What Should I Do With My Life, that the one feeling everyone in this book has experienced is of missing out on life. Adopting the Craftsman Mindset To summarize, I presented two different ways people think about their working life. The first is the Craftsman Mindset, which focuses on what you can offer the world. The second is the passion mindset, which instead focuses on what the world can offer you. The craftsman mindset offers clarity, while the passion mindset offers a swamp of ambiguous and unanswerable questions. As I concluded after meeting Jordan Tice, there's something liberating about the craftsman mindset. It asks you to leave behind self-centered concerns about whether your job is just right, and instead put your head down and plug away at getting really damn good. No one owes you a great career, it argues. You need to earn it, and the process won't be easy. With this in mind, it's only natural to envy the clarity of performers like Jordan Tice. But here's the core argument of rule number two. You shouldn't just envy the craftsman mindset, you should emulate it. In other words, I'm suggesting that you put aside the question of whether your job is your true passion, and instead turn your focus toward becoming so good they can't ignore you. That is, regardless of what you do for a living, approach your work like a true performer. This shift in mindset proved an exciting development in my own quest. But as I discovered, it comes more easily for some than for others. When I began exploring the craftsman mindset on my blog, some of my readers became uneasy. I noticed them starting to home in on a common counter-argument, which I should address before we continue. Here's how one reader put it. Tice is willing to grind out long hours with little recognition, but that's because it's in service to something he's obviously passionate about and has been for a long time. He's found that one job that's right for him. I've heard this reaction enough times to give it a name, the argument from pre-existing passion. At its core is the idea that the craftsman mindset is only viable for those who already feel passionate about their work, and therefore it cannot be presented as an alternative to the passion mindset. I don't buy it. First, let's dispense with the notion that performers like Jordan Tice or Steve Martin are perfectly secure in their knowledge that they found their true calling. If you spend any time with professional entertainers, especially those who are just starting out, one of the first things you notice is their insecurity concerning their livelihood. Jordan had a name for the worries about what his friends are doing with their lives, and whether his accomplishments compare favorably. The cloud of external distractions. 
Fighting this cloud is an ongoing battle. Along these lines, Steve Martin was so unsure during his decade-long dedication to improving his routine that he regularly suffered crippling anxiety attacks. The source of these performers' craftsman mindset is not some unquestionable inner passion, but instead, something more pragmatic. It's what works in the entertainment business. As Mark Cass Stevens put it, the tape doesn't lie. If you're a guitar player or a comedian, what you produce is basically all that matters. If you spend too much time focusing on whether or not you found your true calling, the question will be rendered moot when you find yourself out of work. Second, and more fundamental, I don't really care why performers adopt the craftsman mindset. As I mentioned earlier, their world is idiosyncratic, and most of what makes them tick doesn't generalize. The reason I focused on Jordan's story is that I wanted you to see what the craftsman mindset looked like in action. In other words, forget why Jordan adopted this mindset, and notice instead how he deploys it. In the next chapter, I will argue that, regardless of how you feel about your job right now, adopting the craftsman mindset will be the foundation on which you'll build a compelling career. This is why I reject the argument from pre-existing passion, because it gets things backward. In reality, as I'll demonstrate, you adopt the craftsman mindset first, and then the passion follows. By the time I met him, Alex Berger had managed to break into this elite world. He had recently sold a pilot to USA Network. To sell a pilot is to sell an idea. You sit down in a room with three or four executives from the network and spend five minutes pitching your vision. At a cable network like USA, these executives will hear about 15 to 20 such pitches a week. They then retreat to a staff meeting and choose three or four to actually buy. Alex's idea was one of the four they bought that week. Alex has a few more hurdles to leap before his show makes it on the air at USA, but selling a pilot by itself is seen as impressive in the industry, a mark that you know what you're doing. As if to emphasize this impressiveness, one of the executives at USA who liked Alex's work helped staff him on an already running show, the hit spy drama Covert Affairs so that he'd have something to do while waiting for the pilot decisions to be made. Not that Alex needed the boost to his reputation. He had already written and aired episodes for three different shows leading up to this point. His latest gig was on the stop-motion comedy Glenn Martin DDS, which he had co-created with Michael Eisner and had run for two seasons. In other words, there's no doubt that Alex is an established writer in an industry that allows few through its gates. The question is, how did he do it? How Alex Berger Broke Into Hollywood What makes television a hard industry to crack is the fact that it's a winner-take-all market. There's only one type of career capital here, the quality of your writing, and there are thousands of hopefuls trying to gain enough of this capital to impress a very small group of buyers. In this respect, however, Alex had an advantage. At Dartmouth College, he had been a debater, and a damn good one at that. In 2002, his two-man team arrived at the National Debate Tournament with the country's highest rank. Alex then went on to win the Best Speaker Prize at the tournament. In debate, as in television writing, there is no mystery about what separates good from bad. The scoring system is specific and known. To become the country's best debater, therefore, Alex had to master the art of continual improvement. Hearing the story of how he then went on to succeed in Hollywood convinced me that it was exactly this skill that fueled his fast rise. When Alex made the decision to move to Hollywood, his logic in typical debater fashion was airtight. I figured I could always apply to law school, he recalled thinking, but realistically this would be my only chance to try out writing. Alex admits that when he first moved west, he wasn't even sure what his goals were. I had a number of things I wanted to do, but didn't know what they meant. I thought I wanted to be a network executive, for example, but had no idea what that involved. I thought I might be a TV writer, but didn't know what that meant either. 
This was not a classic case of the young man building the courage to follow his unmistakable passion. When Alex first arrived in LA, he took a job as website editor for the National Lampoon. Once there, he discovered that the Lampoon was also interested in television production. Drawing from the adage, write what you know, Alex pitched them Master Debaters, a show that required comedians to debate humorous topics in front of a panel of judges. He was given a modest amount of money to film a pilot, which he did, in a Borders bookstore in Westwood. But making television shows is a tough game, and the National Lampoon's tentative effort didn't go anywhere. What I like about Alex's story is what he does next. He quit his job at the National Lampoon and took a position as an assistant to a development executive at NBC. It's here that I see Alex's debater instincts stir back to life. The National Lampoon was too far to the periphery of the industry to teach him what it takes to succeed. By accepting an assistant position, he threw himself into the center of the action where he could find out how things actually work. It didn't take long for Alex to discover what allows some writers to succeed in catching the attention of a network while so many others fail. They write good scripts, a task that's more difficult than many imagine. Spurred by this insight, Alex turned his attention to writing, lots of writing. During the eight months he spent as an assistant, he dedicated his nights to working on a trio of different writing projects. First, before Alex left the National Lampoon, they had optioned his master debater's idea to VH1. While an assistant, Alex was still polishing the script for the VH1 version of the pilot. In the end, like most pilots, nothing ever came of the VH1 option. At the same time, he was working on a pilot for an unrelated show along with the producer he had met at the Lampoon. And on his own, he was writing a screenplay about his life growing up in Washington, D.C. I might finish writing at 2 or 3 a.m., then have to leave at 8 the next morning to get back to my job at NBC on time, Alex recalls. It was a busy period. After eight months as an assistant, Alex heard about a job opening for a script assistant on Commander-in-Chief, a West Wing copycat helmed by Gina Davis. He jumped at the chance to observe professional TV writers up close, even though it was still a low-level position. On the side, he also added to his portfolio a spec script in progress for the HBO series Curb Your Enthusiasm, aggressively seeking feedback on his early drafts. I thought I needed more samples to get work, he recalls. While working as a script assistant for Commander-in-Chief, Alex started to pitch episode ideas to the room. One of the privileges of being a script assistant is that you can always get a quick consideration of your pitch. Not long before the show was canceled, he finally caught the attention of the room with an episode idea about lost missiles from a plane crash in Pakistan and the political fallout of a gay commitment ceremony. Working with Cynthia Cohen, one of the staff writers on the show, he produced a draft of the episode. For those with free TiVo space, I recommend giving the thumbs up to a groundbreaking episode of Commander-in-Chief this Thursday at 10, Alex wrote in an email to friends around this time. Why groundbreaking, you ask? Because within the first 10 minutes, for the first time in the history of network television, the words Alex and Berger will appear in succession, mind you, just underneath the words written by. With his first produced television script now in hand, things began to move quickly for Alex. After Commander-in-Chief was cancelled, he took another low-level job, this time working with the producer Jonathan Lisko in the run-up for his new show, Kayville, a post-Katrina New Orleans drama being developed for Fox. Given his writing credit, however, and a collection of increasingly polished spec scripts, this job became an informal tryout for Alex. He was given the chance to impress Lisko, which he did. When a spot opened on the writing staff for Kayville, it was given to Alex, his first official position as a staff writer. He went on to write and air two episodes before the show was canceled. Chapter 5. The Power of Career Capital in which I justify the importance of the craftsman mindset by arguing that the traits that make a great job great are rare and valuable, and therefore, 
If you want a great job, you need to build up rare and valuable skills, which I call career capital, to offer in return. The Economics of Great Jobs In the last chapter, I offered a bold proposition. If you want to love what you do, abandon the passion mindset. What can the world offer me? And instead, adopt the craftsman mindset. What can I offer the world? My argument for this strategy starts with a simple question. What makes a great job great? In exploring this question, it helps to get specific. In rule number one, I provided several examples of people who had great jobs and love or loved what they do. So we can draw from there. Among others, I introduced Apple founder Steve Jobs, radio host Ira Glass, and master surfboard shaper Al Merrick. Using this trio as our running example, I can now ask what it is specifically about these three careers that makes them so compelling. Here are the answers that I came up with. Traits that define great work. Creativity. Ira Glass, for example, is pushing the boundaries of radio and winning armfuls of awards in the process. Impact. From the Apple II to the iPhone, Steve Jobs has changed the way we live our lives in the digital age. Control. No one tells Al Merrick when to wake up or what to wear. He's not expected in an office from 9 to 5. Instead, his Channel Island Surfboards factory is located a block from the Santa Barbara beach, where Merrick still regularly spends time surfing. Jake Burton Carpenter, founder of Burton Snowboards, for example, recalls how negotiations for the merger between the two companies happened while he and Merrick waited for waves in a surf lineup. This list isn't comprehensive, but if you consider your own dream job fantasies, you'll likely notice some combination of these traits. We can now advance to the question that really matters. How do you get these traits in your own working life? One of the first things I noticed when I began to study this question is that these factors are rare. Most jobs don't offer their employees great creativity, impact, or control over what they do and how they do it. If you're a recent college graduate in an entry-level job, for example, you're much more likely to hear, go change the water cooler, than you are, go change the world. By definition, we also know that these traits are valuable, as they're the key to making a job great. But now we're moving into well-trod territory. Basic economic theory tells us that if you want something that's both rare and valuable, you need something rare and valuable to offer in return. This is Supply and Demand 101. It follows that if you want a great job, you need something of great value to offer in return. If this is true, of course, we should see it in the stories of our trio of examples. And we do. Now that we know what to look for, this transactional interpretation of compelling careers becomes suddenly apparent. Consider Steve Jobs. When Jobs walked into Paul Terrell's bite shop, he was holding something that was literally rare and valuable, the circuit board for the Apple I, one of the more advanced personal computers in the fledgling market at the time. The money from selling a hundred units of that original design gave Jobs more control in his career. But in classic economic terms, to get even more valuable traits in his working life, he needed to increase the value of what he had to offer. It's at this point that Jobs' ascent began to accelerate. He takes on $250,000 in funding from Mark Markula and works with Steve Wozniak to produce a new computer design that is unambiguously too good to be ignored. There were other engineers in the Bay Area's homebrew computer club culture who could match Jobs and Wozniak's technical skill. But Jobs had the insight to take on investment and to focus this technical energy toward producing a complete product. The result was the Apple II, a machine that leaped ahead of the competition. It had color graphics. The monitor and keyboard were integrated inside the case. The architecture was open, allowing rapid expansion of memory and peripherals, such as the floppy disk, which the Apple II was the first to introduce into mainstream use. This was the product that put the company on the map and that pushed Jobs from a small-time entrepreneur into the head of a visionary company. He produced something of great value, 
and in return, his career got an injection of creativity, impact, and control. The radio host Ira Glass was given the opportunity to create his genre-defining radio show, This American Life, only after he had proven himself as one of public radio's best editors and hosts. Glass started as an intern and then moved on to become a tape cutter for All Things Considered. Consider, for example, the author Pamela Slim, a believer in the passion mindset who wrote the popular book Escape from Cubicle Nation. Slim describes on her website the following sample dialogue, which she claims she has often. Me. So, are you ready to move forward with your plan? Them. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I can do it. Who am I to pretend to be a successful artist, coach, consultant, masseuse? What if everyone looks at my website and laughs hysterically that I would even consider selling my services? Why would anyone ever want to connect with me? Me. Time for a little work on your backbone. Motivated by these encounters, Slim launched a phone seminar product called Rebuild Your Backbone. Its goal is to convince more people to be like Lisa Fewer by finding the courage to follow their dreams. The course description says Slim will answer questions like, why do we get stuck living other people's models of success? And how do we get the courage to do big things in the world? It costs $47. Rebuild Your Backbone is an example of the courage culture, a growing community of authors and online commentators pushing the following idea. The biggest obstacle between you and work you love is a lack of courage. The courage required to step away from other people's definition of success and to follow your dream. It's an idea that makes perfect sense when presented against the backdrop of the passion mindset. If there's some perfect job waiting for us out there, every day we're not following this passion is a wasted day. When viewed from this perspective, Fewer's move appears courageous and long overdue. She could be a guest lecturer in Pamela Slim's teleseminar. But this idea crumbles when viewed from the perspective of career capital theory a perspective that makes Karma Kids Yoga suddenly seem like a poor gamble. The downside of the passion mindset is that it strips away merit. For passion proponents like Slim, launching a freelance career that gives you control, creativity and impact is easy. It's just the act of getting started that trips us up. Career Capital Theory disagrees. It tells us that great work doesn't just require great courage, but also skills of great and real value. When Fewer left her advertising career to start a yoga studio, not only did she discard the career capital acquired over many years in the marketing industry, but she transitioned into an unrelated field where she had almost no capital. Given yoga's popularity, a one-month training program places Fewer pretty near the bottom of the skill hierarchy of yoga practitioners, making her a long way from being so good she can't be ignored. According to career capital theory, she therefore has very little leverage in her yoga working life. It's unlikely, therefore, that things will go well for Fewer, which, unfortunately, is exactly what ended up happening. As the recession hit in 2008, Fewer's business struggled. One of the gyms where she taught closed. Then, two classes she offered at a local public high school were dropped. And with a tightening economy, demands for private lessons diminished. In 2009, when she was profiled for the Times, she was on track to make only $15,000 for the year. Toward the conclusion of the profile, Fewer sends the reporter a text message. I'm at the food stamp office now, waiting. It's signed, sent from my iPhone. Two days after Lisa Fewer's profile was published, the Times introduced its readers to another marketing executive, Joe Duffy. Like Fewer, Duffy worked in advertising and eventually began to chafe at the constraints of corporate life. I was tired of the agency business, he recalls. I wanted to simplify my life and focus on the creative side again. Given that Duffy's original training was as an artist, he had entered the advertising industry as a technical illustrator only after he had a hard time making a living with his paintings. 
Supporters of the passion mindset might encourage someone in Duffy's situation to leave advertising behind and return to his passion for the creative arts. Duffy, it turns out, is from the craftsman school of thought. Instead of fleeing the constraints of his current job, he began acquiring the career capital he'd need to buy himself out of them. His specialty became international logos and brand icons. As his ability grew, so did his options. Eventually, he was hired away by the Minneapolis-based Fallon McElligot Agency, which allowed him to run his own subsidiary within the larger organization, calling it Duffy Designs. In other words, his capital had bought him more autonomy. After 20 years at Fallon McElligot, working on logos for major companies such as Sony and Coca-Cola, Duffy once again invested his capital to gain more autonomy. This time, by starting his own 15-person shop, Duffy & Partners. This entrepreneurial move contrasts sharply with Fewer's. Duffy started his own company with enough career capital to immediately thrive. He was one of the world's best logo men and had a waiting list of clients. Fewer started her company with only 200 hours of training and an abundance of courage. It's fair to guess that by the time Duffy recently retired, he loved what he did. His work gave him heaps of control and respect and, depending on your view of the importance of advertising, also had a great impact on the world. To me, however, the most vivid contrast to Fewer's story was Duffy's purchase of Duffy Trails, a hundred-acre retreat on the banks of Wisconsin's Tobatick River. Duffy is an avid cross-country skier, and the five miles of wooded trails, skiable from November through March, made the retreat irresistible. As reported by the New York Times, the property can comfortably house at least 20 guests, spread over three different residential outbuildings, but on the hottest summer nights, it's the screen gazebo by the retreat's 16-acre Bassstock Lake that attracts the most visitors. Duffy purchased this property at the age of 45. In other words, not long after the age at which Fewer left advertising to pursue her yoga business. It's this parallel that gives this pair of stories their frosty and undertones. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and one traveler chose the path to mastery, while the other was called toward passion's glow. The former ended up celebrated in the industry, in control of his own livelihood, and weekending with his family in a forested retreat. The latter ended up on food stamps. This comparison is not necessarily fair, we don't know that Fewer could have replicated Duffy's success if she had stayed in marketing and advertising and had focused her restless energy on becoming excellent. But as a metaphor, the story works nicely. The image of Fewer waiting in line for food stamps, while Duffy, at a similar age, returns from a successful overseas trip to spend a relaxing weekend skiing at Duffy Trails, is striking. It captures well both the risk and the illogic of starting from scratch, as contrasted with the leverage gained by instead acquiring more career capital. Both Fewer and Duffy had the same issues with their work. These issues emerged at around the same time, and they both had the same desire to love what they do. But they had two different approaches to tackling these issues. In the end, it was Duffy's commitment to craftsmanship that was the obvious winner. When Craftsmanship Fails Not long before I started writing this chapter, I received an email from John, a recent college graduate and longtime reader of my blog. He was concerned about his new job as a tax consultant. Though he found the work to be sometimes interesting, the hours were long and the tasks were fiercely prescribed, making it difficult to stand out. Aside from not liking the lifestyle, John complained, I'm concerned that my work doesn't serve a larger purpose, and in fact, that it actively hurts the most vulnerable. This chapter has argued in favor of the craftsman mindset and against its passion-centric alternative. Part of what makes the craftsman mindset thrilling is its agnosticism toward the type of work you do. The traits that define great work are bought with career capital, the theory argues. They don't come from matching your work to your innate passion. Because of this, 
you don't have to sweat whether you found your calling. Most any work can become the foundation for a compelling career. John had heard this argument and wrote me because he was having a hard time applying it to his life as a tax consultant. He didn't like his work and he wanted to know if, like a good craftsman, he should just suck it up and continue to focus on getting good. This is an important question and here's what I told John. It sounds like you should leave your job. On reflection, it became clear to me that certain jobs are better suited for applying career capital theory than others. To aid John, I ended up devising a list of three traits that disqualify a job as providing a good foundation for building work you love. There are many young people who start down the same path as Glass, landing an internship at a local NPR station and then moving up to a low-level production position. But Glass began to break away from the pack when he turned his focus on making his skills more rare and more valuable. The crispness of his segment editing eventually gained him the opportunity to host a few of his own segments on air. And even though Glass has a voice that mocks everything sacred about what a radio personality should sound like, he began to win awards for his segments. It's possible that a latent natural talent for editing may be playing a role here. But recall from rule number one that Glass emphasizes the importance of the hard work required to develop skill. All of us who do creative work, you get into this thing and there's like a gap. What you're making isn't so good, okay? It's trying to be good, but it's just not that great, he explained in an interview about his career. The key thing is to force yourself through the work, force the skills to come. That's the hardest phase, he elaborated in his Road Trip Nation session. In other words, this is not the story of a prodigy who walked into a radio station after college and walked out with a show. The more you read about Glass, the more you encounter a young man who was driven to develop his skills until they were too valuable to be ignored. This strategy worked. After the success of his short segments for All Things Considered, Glass was tapped to co-host a string of different local shows produced out of Chicago's WBEZ station, further increasing the value of his skills. In 1995, when the station manager at WBEZ decided to put together a free-form show with an eye toward national syndication, a show called This American Life, Glass was at the top of his list. His career today is rich with creativity, impact, and control. But when you read his story, the economic undertones are unmistakable. Glass exchanged a collection of hard-won, rare, and valuable skills for his fantastic job. With Al Merrick, not surprisingly, we get the same style of story. The rare and valuable skill that launched Merrick's career as a professional surfboard shaper is crystal clear. His boards won competitions. What's important to note is that this was not always the case. Merrick picked up the trade of fiberglass shaping from his years spent as a boat builder, and he knew about surfing from his own on-again, off-again relationship with the sport, but it took an abundance of hard work to get his board crafting skills to the place where they were valuable. Starting out, a lot of time you're afraid that you're going to be a failure, that this guy you're making a board for is a world champion and his boards won't be working right, he recalled in his Road Trip Nation session. It just makes me work harder and try harder to accomplish what I'm trying to accomplish with a surfboard. Having an office a block from the beach with the freedom to take off to surf on a moment's notice sounds great, but it's not the type of job that is just being handed out. To get it, Merrick realized he needed a rare and valuable skill to offer in exchange. Once he had surf pros like Kelly Slater riding his boards and winning, he became free to dictate the terms of his working life. Here then are the main strands of my argument. The career capital theory of great work. The traits that define great work are rare and valuable. Supply and demand says that if you want these traits, you need rare and valuable skills to offer in return. Think of these rare and valuable skills you can offer as your career capital. The craftsman mindset, with its relentless focus on becoming so good they can't ignore you, is a strategy well suited for acquiring career capital. This is why it trumps the passion mindset if your goal is to create work you love.
Jobs, Glass, and Merrick all adopted the craftsman mindset. Some even used these exact words in describing themselves. I was a craftsman, said Merrick in an interview on his early days as a board shaper. Career capital theory tells us that this is no coincidence. The traits that define great work require that you have something rare and valuable to offer in return. Skills I call career capital. The craftsman mindset, with its relentless focus on what you produce, is exactly the mindset you would adopt if your goal was to acquire as much career capital as possible. Ultimately, this is why I promote the craftsman mindset over the passion mindset. This is not some philosophical debate on the existence of passion or the value of hard work. I'm being intensely pragmatic. You need to get good in order to get good things in your working life. And the craftsman mindset is focused on achieving exactly this goal. But there is, I must admit, a darker corollary to this argument. The passion mindset is not just ineffective for creating work you love. In many cases, it can actively work against this goal sometimes with devastating consequences. From Courage to Food Stamps A pair of articles published within two days of each other in the New York Times in the summer of 2009 emphasize the contrast between the passion mindset and the craftsman mindset. The first article concerned Lisa Fewer. At the age of 38, Fewer quit her career in advertising and marketing. Chafing under the constraints of corporate life, she started to question whether this was her calling. I'd watched my husband go into business for himself, and I felt like I could do it too, she said. So she decided to give entrepreneurship a try. As reported by the Times, Fewer enrolled in a 200-hour yoga instruction course, tapping a home equity loan to pay the $4,000 tuition. Certification in hand, she started Karma Kids Yoga, a yoga practice focused on young children and pregnant women. I love what I do, she told the reporter when justifying the difficulties of starting a freelance business. The passion mindset supports Fewer's decision. To those enthralled by the myth of a true calling, there's nothing more heroic than trading comfort for passion. Mike's Capital Mike Jackson leveraged the craftsman mindset to do whatever he did really well, thus ensuring that he came away from each experience with as much career capital as possible. He never had elaborate plans for his career. Instead, after each working experience, he would stick his head up to see who was interested in his newly expanded store of capital, and then jump at whatever opportunity seemed most promising. One could argue that luck also played an important role in Mike's story. He was, for example, lucky to find a personal connection to a venture capitalist, and then to hit it off when they met in person. But these types of small breaks are common. What mattered most in Mike's story is that once he stumbled through the door, his career capital went to work getting him a fantastic job offer. If you spend time around Mike, you quickly realize how serious he is about doing what he does well. It's true that he now loves his work, but he's still quick to turn the conversation back to how he approaches it. As you'll learn more about in the next chapter, Mike literally tracks every hour of his day down to quarter hour increments on a spreadsheet. He wants to ensure that his attention is focused on the activities that matter. It's so easy to just come in and spend your whole day on email, he warned. On the sample spreadsheet he sent me, he allots himself only 90 minutes per day for email. The day before we last spoke, he had only spent 45. This is a man who is serious about doing what he does really well. In the end, Mike's focus on capabilities over callings obviously paid off. He has a fantastic job, but it was one that required a fantastic store of career capital to be offered in exchange. Chapter 7 Becoming a Craftsman In which I introduce deliberate practice, the key strategy for acquiring career capital, and show how to integrate it into your own working life. Why is Jordan Tice a better guitar player than me? Jordan Tice and I both started playing guitar at the age of 12. 
After receiving my first guitar, I formed a band and several months later performed my first concert. A reduced speed interpretation of Nirvana's All Apologies played to polite applause at the Tollgate Grammar School's sixth grade talent show. After this, I got serious. I took lessons throughout junior high school and high school. I played every day, sometimes rocking blues solos to Hendrix recordings for hours at a time. My band, which had the questionable name of Rocking Chair, played around a dozen shows a year. Festivals, parties, competitions, anywhere really that people would allow us to set up our equipment. We once played a gig in a graveyard facing a parking lot. Our drummer's mom videotaped it. When she pans the camera from our setup in front of the graves to the lot, you realize that the crowd consists of no more than a dozen people on folding chairs. She still finds it funny to play this tape. By the time I graduated high school, I could play from a repertoire of hundreds of songs, ranging from Green Day to Pink Floyd. In other words, I had reached the level of expertise you would expect from someone who had played an instrument seriously for the last six years. But this is what I find fascinating. Compared to Jordan Tice's ability at this same age, I was mediocre. Jordan picked up guitar at the same point in his life as I did. But by the time he graduated high school, he had been touring the Mid-Atlantic with a group of professional bluegrass musicians and had signed his first record deal. When I was in high school, the acoustic group Nickel Creek was thought of admiringly by my grades music snobs as Dave Matthews for cool people. When Jordan was in high school, he regularly played gigs with their bass player, Mark Schatz. The question hanging over this comparison is why, even though we had both played seriously for the same amount of time, did I end up an average high school strummer while Jordan became a star? <laughs>